Why the name the Zeitgeist Movement? As some might know, I'm a filmmaker and I've used that term, but it really has nothing to do with it. The term zeitgeist is defined as the general intellectual, moral, and cultural climate of an era. And of course, the term movement simply implies motion or change. So the zeitgeist movement, by definition, is an organization which seeks to change the dominant intellectual, moral, and cultural climate of a time, uh, for reasons of which will be discussed uh, in a moment. The movement was founded in 2008, and since that time it's gained over half a million subscribers with about 1,100 chapters across 70 countries uh, in a very short period of time, in effect, which is quite impressive uh, in my sense of history. Originally, the movement was partnered with an organization called the Venus Project, and we were still very much in support of the work of Jacques Fresco, of course, absolutely. But this relationship has disbanded for a number of reasons, and the two organizations coexist with very similar pursuits. The Zeitgeist Movement chooses not to be grounded to a singular institution or figure or even data set. Rather, we're interested in developing an emergent train of thought and highlighting that train of thought for others to absorb and identify with and expand upon in the emergent nature of any type of intellectual development. The model of the movement is really nothing original. Uh, it's fundamentally based on the civil rights movement structures that have proven effective over time in different areas of the world. Uh, this includes the use of educational programs, events, of course, and eventually, as our phases unfold, mass nonviolent protest actions. Now, Jason's going to be talking about the basic structure and activism of the movement later on, but I want to quickly throw out that the Zeitgeist Movement is really defined by its chapters. So everyone listening that's in a chapter or maybe isn't in a chapter, please understand that uh, this is a chapter-based movement structure. Uh, we have project teams that emerge out of those chapters, and of course the actual projects and events themselves are, are just another attribute of that, of the communication process that we work on. Now, the structural goal, which isn't something that's brought up very often for those that follow the movement, uh, is what you could call critical mass uh, on a global scale. A mass strong enough to affect the operation of society by its collective efforts from a grassroots level. The Zeitgeist Movement isn't a political movement, nor, for many reasons I don't have time to explain, nor do we identify with the political structure and the way it unfolds. It is basically an elitist structure coming out of a long history of elitist mentalities, and it's been an illusion that this sort of democratic process that everyone throws around has actually served the majority of the population. Okay, now, why are we here then? I'm going to present a very generalized statement as the basic goal, and then work backwards to define the terms that comprise this. As stated, we seek an economic model, a new economic model, based not on the movement of money, and the dynamics associated with such a system, but rather on truly objective scientific resource management and allocation, strategically seeking to enable an equitable distribution of all goods and services to meet the needs of the entire global human population while ensuring maximum environmental sustainability over generational time. Now, of course, that's a big mouthful. Let's break this down. What does this mean? Well, first we have the concept of an economic model. What is economics? The Greek root of the word basically means management of a household, also implying concepts of thrift or conservation, hence the term economize. So therefore, an economy is a method of organizing materials that seeks to reduce waste, hence increase efficiency in its process of providing for a population. Simple enough. So next we have our qualifier, where this economic model we speak of is, quote, not based on the movement of money and the dynamics associated. Why are we ruling out the monetary system? Well, because as radical as this may seem, uh, the model cannot be logically considered a true economy by the definition we've just described. The inherent strategies associated with the monetary model actually reinforces the opposite of what a true economy is supposed to be, as we just defined. The notions of preservation, efficiency, sustainability, hence the need to economize, are actually the enemies, as I will point out, of our current model. 
We live, in fact, in an anti-economy. The first thing to understand is that the only thing that keeps you employed in our system is constant or cyclical consumption. The fuel of our world economy, if you will, is the interest to keep buying and consuming and buying and consuming. The more turnover, the greater our GDP and so-called economic growth we keep hearing people talk about as though it actually represents something tangible in an empirical sense. If, for example, a computer company decided to actually decide, you know, to make strategically optimized products, Apple Computer, for example, uh, and they decided to create goods that would actually evolve, they would be designed to last, not to be replaced. Uh, product development would be with the most durable design, scientifically evaluated, enabling structural updates to current equipment that's already in existence in the interest to extend the life and maximize preservation and efficiency, rather than the constant replacement of things. I can assure you that computer company uh, would suffer tremendously in profit, not to mention the labor levels they have would drop substantially. This train of thought goes for all industries. In fact, I would say the core driving force of the system today is really inefficiency. Efficiency and sustainability are the enemies. And this issue is more apparent today than ever before because of the tremendous advancement in technology. When the monetary market exchange model as we know it began many, many centuries ago, this inefficiency that's inherent was masked by the fact that there was a great deal of raw human labor involved in the production of goods and services. Imagine the amount of time and energy it took for a farmer with a plow to plant and harvest without modern equipment we have today. When you compare the two, you begin to see something very interesting. What's happened essentially is that our technological ingenuity, our ability to create tools that help us to ease our labor and make our lives easier and abstraction has shifted the tides, if you will, from people being actually required to do work to get the necessities of life in a very real, tangible, utilitarian way to the existence of this advanced kind of automation society that we're harboring into where we now have to invent arbitrary occupations over and over again structurally purposeless jobs in effect if you're willing to take the time to see it even though it's very hard when you're born into this to recognize them as such just for the sake of monetary circulation alone that's what ne is needed to keep this model going and unfortunately it's not working we can't do it fast enough so efficiency excuse me inefficiency on in a broad scheme is now the current path whether advertent or not for keeping consumption and hence the system, outdated archaic system, if you will, going. And it comes in many forms. Fortunately for the system itself, yet to our human and social detriment, uh, inefficiency is built right in to the structure, as noted prior. Cost efficiency is defined as productive relative to the cost or being effective without wasting expense. This modern economic concept based on money has nothing to do with materials, has nothing to do with design. It's about saving capital, not resources. This is a classic example of how our system is utterly decoupled from any natural state or processes. One of the most misleading statements about this capitalist system that we all share is the classic phrase you might have all heard in Economics 101 that the role is is to produce the highest quality goods at the lowest possible prices. If you really think about that statement, uh, it is an explicitly circular rationale based not on the observ based only, excuse me, on the observation of money and the intrinsic value of money, but yet completely decoupled and devoid of any physical reference or scientific integrity. Uh, it serves, in fact, to support the false idea that market competition is, in fact, a good thing. The result, in short, is the following. One, every item produced in our society is immediately inferior the moment it is created. It is a mathematical impossibility to produce the most strategically conscious goods we can. The system simply will not allow it. The result is copious waste and pollution. The second consequence is that jobs will always be mechanized when it comes, becomes cheaper than human labor. 
This is an ongoing, unstoppable process called technological unemployment and is currently reducing employment and purchasing power at an accelerating rate, even though very few people will ever have the nerve to talk about this in the economic or news media. And three, environmental negligence is built in. It's constant. Not only are disposal methods not done correctly in a scientific appropriate way due to the need to cut costs, the cost efficiency mechanism, but there's also elusively a built-in indifference uh, at the end of the day to the natural order and the preservation of, of the environment. Problems generate profit. Industry thrives on problems and solutions, which are again a form of efficiency is the enemy. So tangible physical efficiency is inverse to actual market economic efficiency, if you will. If you took all the money spent today producing bottled water on this planet, which I was just joking to someone earlier, I was like, God, we've got to get rid of these bottled waters on stage. But you know, what do you do in this society? It's better you walk around. This is what people do. It becomes normality to be so inefficient. We just accept it because our lives are built, it's built into our structure. And it's hard for us to be conscious or even sometimes to even be active uh, with the type of preservation methods that are required. But if you took all the money and sp spent on bottled water production on this planet for drinking and applied it to a massive public filtration system, desalinization, clean infrastructure channels, I suspect it would be paid for many times over. But pollution, as denoted prior, alluded to prior, is another form of inefficiency to be capitalized on. Pollution creates jobs and markets, just as any other form of efficiency, inefficiency does. Uh, just as all of us having more cancer will improve the GDP of our country, because we have to be treated for it. And a final form of inefficiency that I'm just going to throw in there uh, is the creation of false needs for the populace. This is done through advertising and marketing. Uh, you, if you can convince a person that a $5,000 handbag has more use than a $10 one, even though there's absolutely no real utilitarian difference between the two, uh, just because of relative status notions, you've created a new level of emotional and status inefficiency to exploit. And false needs, um, false needs to be filled uh, to conform to the culture. And this is a very rampant thing, and you see this epidemic everywhere. The movement of money through the mechanism of systematic and intrinsic efficiency cannot be called an economy, uh, therefore not valid as a working methodology. So coming back to our statement, what would define a true economy? This leads us to the next point where it says, excuse me, <coughs> Economic, for an economic model to be, for the economic model we speak of, needs to be based on truly objective scientific resource management and allocation. Now, what does that mean? Throughout the course of human history, we as a species have taken on many, many worldviews, uh, from superstitious notions of demons as the cause of illness to you know, countless controlling gods that rule our lives. Humans have been seeking. Uh, since antiquity to understand the causality of their lives. Fortunately, after much turmoil, uh, we've been guided by evolution to discover something truly useful, and it's only been with the past couple thousand years that this has emerged. And this tool has stood the test of time, providing us with continual confirmation of its effectiveness, and we see it all around us. And that's scientific causality. If we recognize science as a tool and process, a verified method of viewing the world and acting upon evidence rather than faith or blind assumptions, we see that a true economy can only exist if organized and orchestrated within the confines of scientific discipline. For instance, science has shown us that we live, yes, on a finite planet with finite resources. We understand the Earth is a single biosphere system, literally symbiotic